Um, all right, a lot of content to go over today, so let's jump right into it. We got, we're covering effectively module two, uh, the rest of module one, I forget exactly where the cutoff is, and a little bit of module three, I believe. Actually, I don't think we explicitly talk about writing files today, so uh, actually, I, I know we don't. So, a lot of content, let's get to it. Uh, and then Monday we'll start proper 116 content. This will be the end of getting spun up with Scala. So first, the lecture question for today. Parsing a file with, uh, with these hashtag separators or pound sign, number sign, as the, this symbol used to be known as. So in a package named lecture, create a class, an object named lecture question with a method named file. So same structure as last time, but the, uh, the content is a little different here. We want a file of method that given a string representing a file name will open that file, read the lines of that file, parse it, separate each line by these number signs, and read each line, and return the sum of all of the values in that file. So you'll have a file in this exact format. Each line has well-formed integer values. You will not have any doubles, uh, but you can have negatives. They'll be separated by hashtags and give me the sum of all of the values in that file. That's what we want to be able to accomplish by the end of this. Uh, and a little more, we also talk about data structures, which you don't technically need. You kind of do, kind of don't for this one. You will uh, use the data structure, but you won't have to work with the data structure. But with that said, let's talk about types. So last time, we talked about Scala types kind of in passing. We, uh, we mentioned that methods need, uh, method parameters have to have their type specified. The return value of a method, that type has to be specified. And every value has to have its type specified. Scala is a strongly typed language. Every, every variable, every return function, every, every return value, everything has to have a specified type. Sometimes we don't have to explicitly say the type if Scala can infer what that type is, but every variable does have a type. It has to have a type. But we didn't talk about what the types were. I just threw things like double and int out there uh, and string in one of the examples and didn't talk about what those were. Those all should be familiar from 115. But I want to talk a little bit more about what these types actually are in Scala. So one first thing in Scala, this will make be a lot more important as we get into week three. But every value in Scala is an object. For, uh, I have this mostly here for those of you who have Java experience where there is a difference between primitives and objects. In Scala, everything is an object. There are no primitives. As we'll see later, the compiler will convert some of these objects into Java primitives. Let's get into a little too much detail uh, than we need right now. But for right now, suffice that everything in Scala is an object. If you're coming from Java, you'll notice all of our examples, every type starts with a capital letter. There's no lower cases. Uh, lower cases do not exist. So all these basic types, start with a capital, and let's look at each one of these one at a time. And I want to go, you've seen these types before, you've worked them, but I want to go a little bit more in depth going with the how do our programs work, a little more in depth than each one of these, and what those impl the implications of the structure of these types are for us as developers. So let's start with int, ints, these are whole numbers, the, uh, in, Python, you had ints and floats. Uh, we've seen these before, but you could kind of get away without really knowing the types of your variables. Here we really have to know, and if we declare an int, that's going to be a 32-bit representation of an integer value. So we have a binary, a 32-bit binary number, and we can fit any value that we can fit in those 32 bits, which is going to give us negative 2.14, oh, I always, 2.14 billion to 2.14 billion positive. That's, uh, that's 2 to the 31 minus 1 is the most, the highest value we can represent. Then we have that 32nd bit to represent the sign, our sign bit to say whether it's positive or negative. Uh, that's why we can't get all the way up to 2 to the 32 minus 1 if you're tracking that that closely, if you're looking at it that close. So we can only represent values in between these two values in this range. So we can overflow an int. An int cannot represent 
this maximum int value plus one. We cannot represent that, the way ints are represented in Scala, we cannot represent that in those 32 bits. That number can't exist in an int, and that will trigger what we call an integer overflow, and it's going to wrap around all the way to the minimum value. So if you're expecting this value ending in an eight, you're actually going to get this value. You're going to get that value, but negative. It's going to wrap around to negative, and you can imagine how much this can completely destroy your program. If you're expecting a large positive number and you're getting a large negative number, this is a very bad, uh, very bad situation to be in. If you, uh, let me jump ahead and jump back. I, I kind of want these slides in the other order. If you do anticipate exceeding the range of an int, we do have long, this is another data type that is in, that can only store integer values, but it's a 64-bit representation. So now we have 64 bits to work with, one sign bit, and then 63 bits to represent the integer itself. So now we can represent a much larger range, and if we want to add one to that max integer value, we'll get what we expect as long as we don't exceed this upper bound. So if you do anticipate your program exceeding the boundaries, that range of a 32-bit int, long as they're available to you, you can have the 64-bit representation, and then you can use these larger values if you're exceeding an int. With both ints and longs, one thing that we're going, we, we probably won't overflow an int in this semester, to be honest. Uh, sometimes, I mean, you gotta be aware of it, but uh, 2.14 billion is a pretty large number, depending on your specific application. You're probably not gonna get up there, unless you're doing a lot of integer math. At that point, you're probably using doubles anyway. But one thing you will run into uh, quite often is integer division. If you're not careful, if you're working with ints and longs, as applies to longs as well, any in integer representation, you can run into integer division. If you have two int values and you divide them, the return value of that division will be an int, which means if that division is not, does not return a whole number, you have some decimal place, well, an int can't represent that decimal, so it gets truncated. And what Scala is gonna do is just completely delete that value. So this, where we should get, we should get 20.4, I should have made something that divides a little more evenly, 20.4 something? 416. 416, that 416 deleted, completely gone, and you only get the 20, you only get the whole number value of that. You only get the whole number portion. So if you're, uh, if you're not careful about your ints and you have two ints that you're dividing, it will be integer division and you are uh, going to run into these truncation errors. This didn't exist in Python. Python will just look at the division and say, hey, there's a, a floating point value. Let me just convert that to a float for you. Because Python chose what types your variables were and it just kind of figured it out and helped you out there. Scala, same thing. Scala actually doesn't have ints and doubles. It just has a number value. And if you have integer division, it'll convert that number. It'll just take the, uh, the decimal. Scala, we have to be careful about this. Two ints, dividing them, it will be integer division. I see this in office hours a lot, so I want to make sure I, I shine a spotlight on this one. Be very, very careful with this. Uh, if you have this situation where you want to divide two values and then you know that they do not always divide evenly, that's where you would use our next type, a double. Use doubles instead of ints. Question? I need to ask, uh, if you divide an integer by a double type, will it convert to a double? Yeah. Oh, th that's a great question. You don't have to hate to ask. Uh, it will convert that to a double. So if you have an integer divided by a double or a double divided by an integer, as long as there's a double somewhere in the mix there, it will return a double. It won't return an int. So as long as one of the two values is a double, You'll be fine. You'll avoid the integer division. Um, yes? Is there any reason to like mutate anything? Because trying to mm -hmm. long is like basically the same thing, but uh, 64 bits, so. So, yeah, this is, a, this is a good question. The, the question is, is there any reason to use an int instead of a long? Uh, especially these days, our processors, everything works on in 64-bit. So when you have a 32-bit int, you actually 
have to have another 32 bits to go into the processor, to go into the CPU. And that extra 32 bits is just wasted space. You're not using it. Uh, but the processor can't work with 32 bits anymore. So you're right, there really is not a good reason to use ints anymore. We should use the 64-bit representation. Um, maybe it's just forced to have it, but I tend to use ints all the time still. Uh, I don't have a good reason for that. Uh, probably just have it. It would be acceptable to use longs only, uh, except when, it, you know, if you have a homework assignment that says this has to return an int, then it's got to return an int uh, just because that's what my grader is expecting. Uh, but yeah, especially if, uh, I mean, there's no real reason to use ints over longs. There's one, I mean, there's a nuanced reason. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole right now, though. If you, uh, I might as well. If you wanted to find a long literal, you have to put an L at the end of the number. So if you want 10 and you want that value, literal value to be a long, you have to say 10 L. Uh, so I don't know, that's one of the reasons that stops me from switching everything to longs. Uh, it's just a minor annoyance though. Uh, it's a major annoyance if you have somebody on your team who uses, you can use lowercase or uppercase Ls. It's a major annoyance if someone on your team uses lowercase Ls though. So those look like ones and all your int values look uh, uh, look larger than they are. If you do use longs with literal values, always use a capital L. <clears throat> All right, so our next value, double, these can have whole numbers and decimal portions. So if we don't have, if we're not working with strictly whole numbers, now uh, we can have doubles, we can bring doubles in to the rescue and they're going to uh, be able to represent those values. Doubles are 64-bit values, uh, and, uh, and they have a section for the number that it's representing, and then one section for the exponent. So 11 bits to represent the exponent, and then 52 bits for the fraction. We won't focus too much on this specific representation in, I believe, 241, so you see 241, I believe, is where you would really see this if you're a computer engineering major. Uh, you might, probably will see it in 341. You'll dive a lot deeper into this for uh, computer science and computer engineering. Um, but suffice this, but for this class, suffice to know that there are two portions, the exponent and the fraction. And this is somewhat of a binary scientific notation. The fraction is going to be ra raised to uh, 2 to the exponent. There are times, uh, I think I've said that. But, uh, but you have the fraction and the exponent in somewhat of a scientific notation form. And of course, one sign bit. We do have loss of precision here. So for example, in decimal, uh, we're used to, uh, let me back up a second. So first, the binary representation, if we want to represent, say, 3 quarters, 0.75 in binary, it's just like how whole numbers in binary, except with fractions. So this is the 1 half, one half place the one quarter place, or one over two to the two place, one over two to the three place, and so on and so forth. Just like in decimal, we have the one over 10 place, the one over 10 squared place, the one over 10 cubed place, or the tenths, hundreds, thousands. Same thing in binary, same way it's represented, just in base two instead of base 10. So in base 10, we have some things like uh, one third, and if we want to write that in decimal form, which is the only way doubles are stored, it's decimal form, uh, scientific notation, binary values. So if we want to store this as a decimal, it's 0 0.333333. And at some point, we're going, if we want to store this in a computer or write this out on a piece of paper, we have to stop writing threes at some point. We have to truncate this value and not represent exactly one third. We can't represent exactly one third in decimal form. At some point, we're going to have to stop especially if we're storing this in a computer. We don't want to fill up our entire hard drive to store one value. And doubles are going to stop at 64 bits. Once you have 64 bits, that's all you have to use. Once you fill that up, truncation, and you have uh, some rounding. You can have rounding errors here because of that truncation. So for example, we have the value 0 0.1. We can represent this in decimal, perfectly fine. 0 0.1, that is the exact value. 
But we can't represent this value in binary as a decimal exactly. This is uh, point zero, then zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, one, repeating forever. At some point, a double is going to truncate this. It's going to stop writing zero, zero, one, one when it's represented in base two, and that's going to be stored in your, uh, in your double. It's actually going to be 1.10011, 1 and then the exponent of negative uh, 4 here, uh, to be very precise. But, at, but there's going to be some truncation. You can't represent 0.1 or any value that can't be represented as a sum of fractions of powers of 2 in your computer. If you have any numbers like that, you can't represent them exactly. They will not be represented exactly. So what does this mean for us? It means if we have this code, we have 0 0.1, which we know is going to be truncated, and we want to multiply it by, say, 3. If you run this code on your laptop, you're not going to get 0 0.3. You will not get the exact value that you're looking for. It's going to be that 0.1 is truncated in representation. If you just print B, it'll print 0 0.1. But you can really see the error once you start working, doing some math with that truncated value. You're going to get approximations. You're going to get truncation. You're going to have your doubles truncated. So what do we do about this? Because this can have serious implications. This first example here is something you should never, ever, ever, ever do. Never do this. Uh, I, I'm sure, I shouldn't say never, because I'm sure there's one really specific case out there. Uh, where you might want to do this. But when you're comparing two doubles, I want to know this 0 0.1 times 3, I would expect that to be 0 0.3. But if I say C, does C, which was 0 0.1 times 0.3, does that equal this value that stores 0 0.3? That is going to return false. So if I have a conditional and I'm saying if this double equal equal this other double, a lot of times that's going to return false when we would expect it to return true. We will actually run into these truncation errors. These will affect us quite often in programming if we're not watching out for them. Now sometimes you get lucky, sometimes the values just happen to be the sum of powers of two and, and uh, it'll work out for you. But sometimes you know, you're not going to be so lucky and you're going to pull your hair out trying to figure out what is going wrong why those doubles, why your conditionals are not firing in the, the way that you expect them to fire. Um, so we don't want to do this. What we can do and what we do is instead see if the difference between two doubles is less than some very small value. And this value can be very, very, very small. As we saw, the, the truncation errors don't show up until quite a few decimal places. So compare those two doubles against some very small difference Take the absolute value of the difference to figure out how far apart those two values are. And then if that difference is less than some very small value, now we're confident that those two doubles are equal enough for our purposes that any difference between those two values was probably just truncation error. We can ignore the truncation error and then uh, go about our way. So if we have this in a conditional, now we're in business. Now these values that we expect to both be 0 0.3, they're close enough to 0 0.3 that we can say, OK, I want to trigger my conditional, run that block of code, because that, those doubles were close enough to each other. Whereas the equal equal, that's going to get us in trouble. But if we have some way of comparing doubles like this, now we're in business. Now we can go about our programs. In 115, we're pretty careful about writing the assignments where you don't have to compare if two doubles are equal. In this course, we are going to have to do that. that this will come up. We strategically avoid it in 115, 116. This is going to be something you have to be aware of. Boolean unit, I don't have a lot to say about this. I'll talk about unit a little, uh, but we, we hit on it on Wednesday already. Boolean is just true or false. Uh, I don't have much to say about that one. Uh, it's lowercase t and lowercase f in Scala. Uh, I guess that's the, the only thing to really know. Uh, unit, this, uh, this is a little more new. If you're coming from Java, like we mentioned on, briefly on Wednesday, is very similar to void. It's a placeholder for nothing. It's used as a return type of a method that doesn't have to return anything. 
uh, where nothing's being returned. For example, the main, uh, I put this on here, uh, the main method and print line. If I want to print something to the screen, I am never calling print line with the concern of, man, I really want a return value from this print line so I can store that in a variable and do some computation with it later. If I'm calling print line, I'm interested in what we call its side effect. And its side effect in that case is printing a value to the screen uh, or more specifically to standard out to display some text to the user. That's what I'm concerned with. I'm not concerned about any return value. So we set the return value to unit to say this method has no return value. So we use that as a placeholder since we have to specify since we have to specify a return type, every method has to have a return type. What do we do when a method doesn't, when we don't want anything returned, when we don't care? Do we say, oh, it returns an int and then always returns zero, something silly like that? No, let's invent something called unit and just say, if it returns unit, we're not concerned with its return value. And that's what Scala does. It says return unit, done. Doesn't have to return anything. Strings are similar to what you've seen in, in, uh, in 115 in other languages and other courses. This uh, is technically a sequence of characters. This is true in most languages as well. I don't know how, uh, how much you, you had to be aware of that or even how much you'll need to be aware of that in this class. But a string is technically a sequence of characters. It's a data structure storing a lot of uh, chars, which is just short for character types. We define these with double quotes in Scala. In uh, Python and JavaScript, you could use either double quotes or single quotes. In Scala, only double quotes allowed. You have to use double quotes to define your string literals is uh, one of the differences, one of the adjustments to make. If you want a double quote in your string literal, you have to escape it with the backslash character. Uh, just like you would put a new line in a string with slash n, a double quote, you do slash and then double quote. You want to double quote inside your, uh, inside your string literal. And there's lots of methods. I won't list them all here. I have uh, a link to some documentation for strings. They're multitudes, just like any language, multitudes, except C, I guess. Uh, multitudes of methods that you can use on strings. You can call on them to be able to work with that, uh, with that data. So a few useful ones here, uh, especially for the homework. Dot, or not the homework, the uh, lecture question for today, dot split. We've seen this in uh, Python and JavaScript. I, I assume that's still in the course. I think they're still, uh, yeah, because they're in UB Infinite. They have to be part of the course stuff. Uh, the split, so you have your string, dot split on some character for the homework, dot split, hashtag, to chop that into a data structure filled with the separate values that that separator was set. Rating. It was separated. Uh, so a lot of nice methods like that. A lot of them you would expect from other languages. If there's one a method, string method named in another language, odds are that same method exists in, uh, in most languages that you use. Same is true with Scala. And again, link, uh, check out the documentation to, uh, to get more methods that you can use. And with all these types, we can convert between them. If there is a valid conversion, we can use this to and then the type method, which will attempt to convert into the type that we specify. So for example, if we have a string, we have a string 6.3. This is a well-formed double, which means it does represent a double value with no syntax errors, no errors in the the uh, formatting of the double. Since that's the case, we could do string.2 double. That'll return 6.3 as a double, and we can store that in a variable of type double. Uh, if that were not a well-formed double, for example, if it was 6.3 or 6six.3 uh, you know, spelled out as a long string, uh, this is going to throw an error and crash our program. So we should be careful about these and only use them when we know either know that the value is well-formed and can be converted, or we have a check before this and check, is this well-formed? If it is, then convert it. If not, handle that some other way. To string is one exception. Everything can be converted to a string. Every object has a to string method. 
We can always convert to a string with, uh, uh, without error. I mean, we can write errors in the toString method if we want, but uh, typically you're not going to have errors when you call toString. And when we're calling to int, if we call to int on a double, we do have that truncation. The decimal portion of a double can't be represented in an int. You can convert them still. You're not going to get an error, but you're also not going to get your decimal portion. It's going to be deleted. And it's always going to, I didn't explicitly mention this, I think it was in the slide, uh, it's always going to take the floor. So it's always deleting the decimal portion, so you're effectively taking the floor of that value. So for example, if you have 5.999999999 and you convert that to an int, that's five, not six. So you can get some, some pretty significant rounding in this, especially if you have a truncation error that happened at some point got you just a little bit less than the value you expect, and then you convert it to an int, and now you got that truncation. You can get it off by one error pretty easily if you're not careful about, uh, if you're not careful about those kinds of things. All right. Any questions about types? Yeah, so, so the question is, uh, it always goes to the floor. So if you have a double converting it to an int or a long, it will always just truncate the decimal. The question is, is there a way to round up? Uh, there is an explicit ceiling method. We call, we could say our double value dot ceiling, and then, uh, actually I'm not 100% if it's a method in the double class. But you can do math dot seal of that double and then to int on that. Now you're guaranteed that you're going to take the ceiling. And there's also a math.round if you want to have the typical uh, 0.5 or higher goes up, lower than 0.5 goes down. Math.round and then to int on that. So you can control that, but if you're, not, uh, if you're not keeping track of that or doing one of those options, you can get that truncation. Uh, you can get that truncation and off by one here. Any other questions? We do have lab next week, yes. There will be lab next week. Uh, next week, it's, uh, uh, it'll be, I'll give you just a quick heads up. Cloning the examples repo, getting IntelliJ set up, getting all the versions of Scala and Java set up, uh, just getting you up and running in the course and making sure that, that you can uh, be successful is the goal of next week's lab. And also meeting your TAs, getting to, to know who's, who you're gonna be working with in those lab sections uh, will be the, the themes for next week's lab. Any other questions on the types, on the previous examples? Yes? What is it? Uh, I believe, yeah, I, did, I will have an example here. Uh, it returns an array of strings. So if I split, when I split this string on semicolons, I'm getting true in index zero of this array, false in index one, and so forth. All those values after the split are going in an array of strings. All right, for loop. Syntax uh, may be uh, you know, a tiny bit different. Uh, it's similar, similar to Python, JavaScript, uh, <laughs> Java. Similar to all those, just a little bit different. Main difference is this little arrow here. The uh, for loop in Scala is a for each loop. I believe you can write a standard for loop, right? I don't know, I never have a reason to these days. Uh, but uh, I, you might be able to, I don't know, I've never, never really tried it. I think I said you can't before and somebody called me out on it. I, I, I'm recollecting something like that. Uh, but the loop we'll see is a for each loop. So if we wanna iterate over a data structure, we're going to name a variable that's going to get those values, store those values, arrow, less than, dash, to form a little arrow, and then the data structure that we're pulling that data from. So we're iterating over the data in this data structure, storing the, each value in the variable, and then executing the loop body in each one. So the behavior you would expect, but we're going to iterate over data structures 
with this and reads just like the Python for variable name in data structure, execute the loop of the body, which this is almost valid Python code. We have a little different syntax in, uh, in Scala. If we want to kind of simulate the standard for loop, if we just want to iterate over some numbers, we have the to method. And this to method, one, two, n, for example, or one, if we just had one, two, ten, as we're using it here, is going to return a data structure containing the values one through ten, and then that data structure can be iterated over. This is very similar to range in Python, where range was creating a data structure of type range in Python, and then you would iterate over that range if you wanted the standard, you know, count zero through ten or one through ten, as we're doing here. Um, this is how we can do that in Scala. Yes? It, so this is starting from one, just because I'm putting one here. I could put zero there, and then it would start from zero. But it's going to start and end at the values we give it. Good question. Uh, I should have started from zero. I don't know why I started for, from one for this example. Uh, so one, two, n creates a data structure. And then we're going to iterate over that. We're going to call our iteration variable i in this case. And then I'm just doing the boring thing of printing those values to the screen. So we have several ways to do this. I'm showing two here. The second one is just to explicitly show that 1, 2, n is returning a data structure of type range, just like in Python. It's returning a data structure of type range, and then we're iterating over that data structure. So you could get used to this syntax and just think that it's magic. I want to show what it's doing. This is a method call that is returning a value of type range, storing the numbers from 1 to n. And then uh, we can iterate over those values. One kind of side note, I'll, I'll mention this as it comes up throughout the semester. Uh, it's not too crucial right now, but two is a method, but any, it's a method of the integer, of the int class, and any method that takes only one parameter in Scala, we're allowed to write that in infix notation. So we can, this is the same as saying one dot two and then parentheses n. It's the same thing. But when it's only taking one parameter, Scala just allows us to use this, what we call syntactical sugar, makes it just a, a little uh, different formatting um, to be able to call those methods. And for example, this plus right here, this is a method of the string class named plus. This is the same as saying this string dot plus and then parentheses i. All these infix calls are method calls in Scala. There are no operators. Plus is not an operator. Two is not an operator. Like in a lot of other languages, these are all methods. But we just had this syn uh, syntactical uh, sugar thing that we can do to make them look like uh, look like expressions, or, or, or sorry, operators. Make them look like operators. All right, so that's just counting. Um, that's, that's not always, there's really not too many use cases for that uh, in programming when actually developing real world apps. But we do want to always, you know, constantly iterate over data structures that already exist or that we're creating right then. Uh, I guess we did do that on the previous slide, but that that structure didn't mean all that much. So here, I want to write a quick program that takes in a string with well-formed Boolean values separated by semicolons, and I want a method that's going to take such a string and return the percentages, the percentage of the values that are the value true. So here I have four trues and one false, for example. I want this method to return 0.8. That's what I want is the return value. I just want the percentage of trues in this string. So I'm expecting 0.8 here. I give this string to my method, takes in a string, returns a double. And the first thing I want to do is split that string. We're going to use that split method. Split it on semicolons. This is going to give me a data structure of strings that contains each of the values that were separated on that split. So I'm taking out the semicolons, getting all those values and throwing those in the data structure, just like split in Python, just like split in JavaScript. Same idea. 
It's returning that data structure, and now we can work with that data. I'm going to initialize some variables to get count how many values I've seen and how many values were true. Yes, there are different ways I could do this. I could do total count equals uh, splits dot length. I, for some reason, I did it this way when I set up the example. Uh, and then we want our loop. This is what we want to what we're learning here. I want to iterate over the splits using this for loop. So I'm going to say for value, which is just any variable name I want to come up with. That could be any valid variable name there. Doesn't matter what it is. I decided to call it value in the splits. So I want to iterate over splits and get value to store one at a time each of the values in this array, in the splits array. And then for each of those values, I'm going to convert it to a Boolean. I'm going to leverage the fact that, that this is a well-formed string. I'm going to assume there's no typos in the true or false. I'm going to assume there's no capital T's or capital F's or anything like that. I'm going to convert them to Booleans, assuming they're well-formed. So this is a little dangerous. If somebody gives us a bad input, the program's going to crash. But I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to assume, oops. I'm going to assume that these are well-formed. So I'm going to convert these strings to Booleans using our to Boolean method and get these values as Booleans in a variable of type Boolean. Now I want to say if that value is true, increment the true count. No else statement here, no else if or anything. Regardless of whether this was true or false, I'm always going to increment our total count by one. So every value I look at, we're incrementing total count by one. And if the value is true, we're going to imp increment the true count by one. And finally, return true count and total count. And here's, and here's where we could have ran into that trap with integer division. If I declare both of these as ints, which realistically they're ints, uh, they, they will only store integer values. I'm counting, I'm enumerating things. I'm only going to have integer values. But once I get to this division, if I'm dividing two ints, I have integer division, and this method always either returns 0 or 1. It is not what I want. It's going to return 1 if all of the values are true, and I have uh, the, the same value divided by itself. Or I have any other case, if I have any falses at all, in this example, point 0.8 is going to be truncated to 0. The point 0.8 disappears. I have 0 will be the result. Uh, this will resolve to zero, it's integer division. After the division, Scala will say, whoa, I'm returning a double, let's convert that back to a double, or, or, or over to a double. Let's convert that to a double to return it. But that conversion happens after the division. Scala will not look ahead and say, hey, we're returning a double, maybe I should preserve the decimal portion. No, it's integer division and then convert to a double to return. So we have to be careful with that. If this is int and int, this doesn't work, it returns zero in this case. So we make, just made these doubles. We could also have these as ints, and then at least one of these do a two double, and we get around it that way as well. Um, but we do, whatever we do, we have to be aware of that integer, potential integer division. Any questions on this example? We, we combined uh, a good number of things that we just saw. So any questions on this one? Yes. So the condition of a Boolean, uh, the condition of, a, of an if statement, the condition has to be a Boolean expression, which has to be any expression that resolves to a Boolean value. This is already a Boolean value, so I don't have to do anything else. Uh, th this is one case where you would see, uh, especially all of we all did it, uh, when you're new to programming, you would say value as if value as Boolean equals equals true. Uh, but you don't have to do that. It's already a Boolean value. If it's true, it's going to equal true. If it's false, equals true is going to evaluate to false. You already have the value you're looking for, so you don't need to do the equal equal true. It would still be adding. So if value as Boolean is false. This will be false. This block doesn't run, so we're not adding to true count, but we will always add to total count. Why would that block run to false into Boolean? It, it's a Boolean, but this Boolean value, if this, the value of this Boolean is false, 
then the conditional does not run. So since the value is, uh, so since I, maybe because I named it value as Boolean, the, the name might be tripping you up on that one. Uh, but this resolves, if it resolves to false, then this is not executed. Yeah, good, good uh, question on Twitch, which I want to get to. I don't know if I will get to it uh, on this. Is how do I create a, a test file? Uh, I'll at least be able to talk about it in the slides. I want to give an example, but we'll see if we, we get to that. So reading files is something you have to do for the lecture question. How do we read a file? There's not a lot to talk about for this one, so I'll go pretty quick through this. There's one magic line in this that just does what we need it to do. And let's talk about that. So, but what I do need to focus on is how do you test, which is the question on, in Twitch. Uh, to test, you'll create a test file, uh, any file that is formatted the way you expect. So if you take the one directly from the slides, that's suitable. Save that in a text file. If you right click somewhere in your project, right click, new file, name it, whatever you're going to name it, whatever you're going to call it in your main method when you do your testing. Name it the same thing so it can point to that. The one big trick, you know, trick-ish to this is when you run your programs in IntelliJ, they will run from the root directory of your project. So this file name has to be relative to your root directory of your project. So for example, if you're creating that test file in your SRC directory right next to your code, this would have to be SRC slash whatever you named your file or else it, you're going to get that file not found error. You're gonna see that. Uh, personally, I like to go to the root directory of my project, create a data folder, and then put all my data in that folder, and then have all my names relative to that. That, that way I'm not mixing my data with my code. I like to keep those separate. Um, but it's personal preference. As long as your, a lot of the questions are right for this class, it'll, your method will take a file name. Just make sure that you are reading that file name and not hard coding the file name in your method because I'm not going to name my files exactly what you are. I mean, maybe, but you'd have to just get lucky on that one. Your question. So, is there a range that has, like, a range that has 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 a range a, the, the type array takes a type parameter, so you do have to have two types. You have to say, what type does this array store? So array, is not type. array is a type, and string is a type, but an array takes a type parameter. Uh, we will talk about that, and uh, we will definitely get to it. Like, I believe in a few slides I'll briefly talk about it. Um, so let me, let me get through this example, and I'll, I'll return to that. I'll come back to that. So. We have our first import, scala.io.source. This class, object, oh, this uh, class or object, oh. Yeah, it doesn't matter anyway at this point. Uh, but, but source is part of the standard library. It comes with Scala. You're going to have access to this. We just have to import it, just like the imports we saw in Python. You just say import you know, of uh, CSV. Uh, import that and then be able to use it in your code. So source, we're going to import. Source has a method from file, which is going to read a file and get its content as a buffered source, which means it's not going to load all of that file into memory all at once. In the very next line, we're going to do exactly that with the get lines method. If we have a very large file, we wouldn't want to use get lines. We'd want to use the buffered features. Uh, but for our case here, we're going to get all the lines and then iterate over those lines as strings. This is similar to, uh, we've done this in Python. You read the file, iterate over the, the lines. Uh, Scala does get rid of that annoyance in Python where it preserves the new line character at the end of each line. We don't have to worry about that in, uh, in Scala. The new line characters are not at the end of those strings is one of the differences. But source that from file loads that file as a buffered source which we can get all the lines from, and that 
uh, reads all the lines and puts them in a data structure that we can iterate over. And now we can iterate over those lines and do whatever we want. I'm just printing it to the screen, uh, not really doing anything creative. For your lecture question, this is where you'd be splitting each line on hashtags, converting those strings to ints, iterating over those, converting those to ints, summing them all up, uh, and doing all that good stuff. Let's print into the screen. Do I, you know, we don't need data structures for this lecture question. Let me, uh, let me go to the code and we'll pick up with data structures uh, after this quick example. So the repo, so let's go to this file, file reading example. I just want to make it, it very explicit what I mean by the file paths. Here is the code that we saw in, in, uh, in the slides. I'm going to run this. Compiling, compiling, and we get some text output here. So I'm reading data.testfile.txt. So when I go, when I talk about the root directory of the project, I mean this root directory, the very top level directory of your project structure. This is where your code is ran from and all file paths have to be relative to this directory. So in this directory, I have a directory named data and then a file named test file in that directory with the content that we were able to print to our screen. Yes? Is the directory the same name as your project? This directory, yes, but you don't, you're, Program runs from that directory, so you don't have to put that directory name. Like this directory is named cc116-examples. Uh, but I didn't have to put that cc116-examples there. I assume that I'm already in that directory, and then I just have to put the, the, uh, the directory and file name from that project directory. They don't have a lot to say about data structures. Maybe we can do this. Uh, but we'll, we'll pick up uh, whatever I don't get next time. So there's three big data structures that we're going to focus on for now. We will talk about three other major ones later. Obviously, it's a, a whole learning objective in the course to talk about linked lists, trees, and graphs. But for now, arrays, lists, and, seek, and, uh, and maps. These are the three we want to do now. Array and list are sequential data types. These are like our lists and arrays in Python and JavaScript. And map is our key value store. So I want to talk about this. All right, I'll, I'll skip. All right, so, so I want to skip some of the, the uh, background of these, but the usage. I'm not gonna go over these much anyway, even if I do revisit this on Monday, but the usage, look through all the methods that we have to be able to create, use, access, arrays, lists. I'll stick with lists a lot in class. How do we work with these? And then finally, maps. And the one thing I wanna explicitly point out, these data structures, when you modify them, you have to reassign the return value to the data structure itself. So when I wanna add a key value pair to a map, I'm reassigning that back to, to the map that I created you have to overwrite that value. You know, I do have to revisit this on Monday. That's too fast. Uh, but anyway, have a nice weekend. I'll see you Monday.